welcome everybody to the Curated Data Platform. My name is Kevin Fiesel. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and I run a predictive analytics team out of Durham, North Carolina. I have a blog called Curated SQL, where I try to find and link to five to 10 interesting posts per day on topics all across the data platform space. So that's curatedsql.com. So what I want to do is talk to you about which data platform technology is right for you. Now, there's a website called DB Engines, and it keeps track of approximately 350 different data platform technologies. Everything from relational database management systems to key value storage, caches, document databases, graph databases, and a whole lot more. Uh, we're probably not going to have time to go through 350 data platform technologies, get a great understanding of all of them, and be able to compare them one versus the other. That's not something humans typically are very good at. So what I'm going to try to do, especially not in an hour, uh, what I'm going to try to do is walk you through some scenarios and talk to you about when different storage types make sense in different contexts. We'll also look at on-premises versus AWS versus Azure for options. And I'll talk to you a little bit about technologies to integrate everything together. So, As a brief warning, like I mentioned, I'm not going to be able to talk about 350 data platform technologies. I am certainly not an expert in 350 data platform technologies. Uh, there are quite a few of them I've never seen nor worked with. So I won't be able to compare individually this product versus this product in much detail. If you have specific questions, uh, please do ask. I'll, I'll um, elaborate as I can, given my knowledge of the different platforms. But if you know, you're saying, hey, I want to talk about NuoDB versus CockroachDB, then that may be a little too esoteric to get down into. But what I will focus on are classes of database system under the guise that within those classes, we can certainly debate products, but all of those products are intended to solve similar types of problems. Also, oftentimes the platform that you have is a reasonable answer for which data platform should I choose? Because you've got experience with it, you've, you know how to work it, you know some of the limitations of it. So understanding when and how to use these different platforms is my goal for today, but I would like to bias you toward what you have now. I'm not saying go tear all that stuff up and throw in a bunch of new things. So let's start with an overview. We all work for a company called Catalyxy Widgets. Uh, this is a great company. It's a major retailer. Widgets, widget accessories, I'm sure you've all heard of them. We have hundreds of stores across the world and a major website with at least dozens of people per day, probably a lot more than that. Our IT team is looking to modernize a bit and uh, look at some key systems and make them better. And they've asked for our guidance as the new data architects. There are a lot of data architects at the company, uh, but that's cool. This is what they currently have today. So they're using SQL Server as their database backend. They have a fairly simple website. Uh, let's say it's a .NET based website. And the finance team hits uh, SQL Server via Excel. They work with all of their financial report queries out of there. Application logs are stored on a share drive someplace on a SAN. So you would say, wow, for a major retailer, that doesn't sound like a lot of infrastructure. Um, yeah, but work with me here. So they've got some pain points and they'd like to help us, uh, they'd like us to help them address it. Finances working out of Excel spreadsheets is a little clunky. They can query the database, they can get the data, they can save it in their own spreadsheets, but these are on-premises Excel spreadsheets, which means you know, only one person can edit at a time, and probably everybody's got a ridiculous number of spreadsheets on a network share someplace. So you have data spreadsheet catastrophes in terms of widespread utilization and just 
Uh, I can't remember which spreadsheet has this data in it, but. Customers are also experiencing some slowness as they try to search through our vast product catalog of all those fine widgets and widget accessories. As they also experience slowness uh, in the product catalog, they're finding some difficulty navigating through our website and making orders. I click the order button and it takes a long time to finish ordering. We have a data science team, but there's no support for those people because, well, the last time the data science team queried the database, it took down the application server. So the data scientists aren't allowed to query the database anymore. Uh, they want us to help them address that problem. And IT, when they do have problems with the application server, have to review logs. Now, as mentioned, all of those logs are on a network share and just text files. So log review is a little painful. For each of these product domains, we are going to look at the types of data platform technologies that are well suited for solving this kind of problem. Not all of the technologies are necessary, and we can certainly discuss different options for how we might implement some of these, but they are solid choices for the job. And if you were looking at one particular implementation of one of these things, this is a good starting point. If you say, I need to implement three of them, you may look at this and say, well, I can combine these technologies in this way and not need all of them. But I wanted to give you kind of a broader overview of where things fit in well. So let's start with tracking finances. The most important thing when it comes to finances, data must be correct. A lot of companies in the US are bound by Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley says that when you publish financial reports, your CFO is verifying that these are correct to the point where if the data is uh, knowingly wrong, then the CFO can be frog marched and sent to prison. Most CFOs don't like being in prison very much, so they try to avoid that whenever possible. Eventual consistency and even just a few missed records, not gonna work for a financial system. We have to have things that are known, correct, and auditable. These financial sorts of systems should be easy for non-IT staff to access. Ideally, they want to use the tools that they're most familiar with, for example, Excel. It is OK for some reports to update over time. So if I have a nightly update of this report, that's OK. So time delay is a different thing from wrong data. If they know this data is accurate as of this point, that's perfectly acceptable. That they can report on. Uh, but they are going to need some real-time capabilities for accounts payable, accounts receivable. I need to be able to know who has paid us and who owes us money still, and to whom do we owe money. And if that's a day off, then it really slows down the process quite a bit. Performance is not as important as correctness. Correctness is the most important thing. Performance is probably like number two or three. It is a factor, but it's not as important. So let's talk about the technologies that are most commonly used for financial systems. We're pretty familiar with this. We're at a SQL Saturday. Relational databases are a fantastic solution for this kind of problem, specifically using online transactional processing data models. Now, relational databases using online analytical processing data models are really good for the reporting side, connectivity to Excel, reviewing results. So let's dive into both of these. Uh, first, I'm gonna start with OLTP. This is a non, um, in particular, I'm talking non-distributed relational databases. So there are distributed relational databases. I actually mentioned two of them, uh, NuoDB and CockroachDB. I'm focusing on single instance, a single instance of Oracle, of SQL Server, of some other data platform, because the data must be correct for everybody. And ACID compliance will help us considerably. There's no risk of a record being written to one server and never making it to the rest of them, and then eventually being dropped. Performance will generally be good especially if you have people who are knowledgeable, who are able to tune systems. Analysts who are really far from the data center will have latency. 
if our data centers are located in the heart of Kansas, uh, if we have data analysts out of Sydney or Tokyo, well, it may take a little while in terms of latency for things to respond. So there may be some overhead there. In the transactional processing world, we've got, first I'm gonna talk on premises. Uh, five major players that I'm gonna mention here. The first one is Postgres. Then we have MySQL, which was bought by Oracle. After MySQL was bought by Oracle, a lot of the MySQL developers went off and created their own fork of the product, calling it MariahDB. On the commercial side, uh, two of the products that I will mention, SQL Server and Oracle. There are plenty of other database platforms that fit this context that are relational databases, uh, such as IBM DB2. So you could fit a lot more on here. These are examples versus entire set. If we're talking in the cloud, I'm gonna start with AWS as our cloud technology. So AWS offers the ability to set up a virtual machine of your product of choice, which is basically saying I can run SQL Server in a virtual machine, infrastructure as a service. They also offer up relational database services. So relational database services is a platform as a service offering. Basically it's saying I can run SQL Server without having to do all of the management capabilities, without having to do all the, the backups and restores and um, patching and dealing with the underlying operating system. So it simplifies that management process. And when I point out SQL Server, by the way, RDS also supports uh, MySQL, MariahDB, Postgres. Aurora is another platform as a service offering. This is actually a fork of the Postgres database system that is made available platform as a service. So it is um, Aurora, as a product. On the Azure side, similar story, though with a little bit more complication. So let's start over here talking about SQL Server. It is SQL Saturday. We can, of course, host SQL Server in a virtual machine on Azure and have it set up, have it installed. We can use Azure SQL Database, platform as a service offering of uh, yeah, I can say of SQL Server. It's not exactly the same thing as the box product, but similar enough that we're gonna we're gonna pretend that it's basically the same. There's also SQL Managed Instances, which is another platform as a service offering. So for both of these, you don't manage the underlying operating system, but here you get a database. Here you get an instance, and here you manage the operating system. Should you wish to use something other than SQL Server, there are platform as a service offerings of MySQL, MariahDB, and Postgres. And of course you can use a virtual machine for hosting Oracle, for hosting MySQL or Postgres or whatever. So, these are our key players in this transactional processing space. I also wanna talk about the analytical side of things, uh, specifically the Kimball model for warehousing, because that is a well-tuned pattern which has worked for decades. The data, when we're working in an OLAP model, still has to be correct. We are driving decisions, company decisions, based off of this information but it is okay for it to be delayed. If it's a day behind, that's okay. We can still work with the information, but I expect the numbers in this report to tie to the numbers in that report. And if I'm using these reports for Sarbanes-Oxley compliance, they'd better tie to the underlying journal entries. Uh, we have data marts, which can be split across the globe to meet the performance needs of analysts. So I can, shard out, I can split out my data and have 
if I have Sydney data analysts, I can have relevant information for them hosted on a server in Australia. If I have Tokyo data analysts, have a server hosted in Japan. And I can also have a central data warehouse which stores the concrete details that are going to make up these data marts. Then we're able to use tools in Excel, you know, use Power Query, uh, use also tools like Power BI to work with this Kimball style warehouse. Uh, these tools are designed from the ground up to work with that data model, so it's a natural fit for them. And within the OLAP world, well, really it's basically the same because they're the same uh, technologies with a little bit of an addition. So I'm focusing on the additions here. With SQL Server, we have analysis services. Uh, with Oracle, you have SBase and Hyperion. In the cloud, there are a couple of technologies that are designed specifically for this sort of warehousing. AWS Redshift is a distributed version of Postgres that is intended for massive parallel processing. Um, the rough equivalency is Azure Synapse Analytics dedicated SQL pools. Azure Synapse Analytics has got a lot of different things going on with it. Um, some of which is a direct analog to Redshift, some of which is an analog to other products, but we'll get to those later. And Analysis Services is available in Azure as well, although with Power BI Premium per user being available, that may not be a great technology to use anymore. Uh, it was always really expensive and Power BI Premium per user basically gives you the same performance quality, but for a lot less money. So I'm not sure I would use Azure Analysis Services at this point. So we have this combination, OLTP, OLAP, relational databases. We saw the same products over and over. Well, these are database designs rather than distinct technologies. So the underlying technology is the same. It's the way we implement it that makes all the difference here. And for each one of these sections, I will include a reference architecture at the end, as well as a link. Give you a link to the slides at the end of today's talk. But that way, if you wanted to see it in action a little bit more, uh, we'll get to have a few more pictures. That was our financial system. So let's now talk about a product catalog. Performance is still critical for a product catalog. If I'm doing a search for a product on your website, I want to get back information really fast. And to the point where people will tend to give up on a website after, my recollection is after about three to five seconds. It is now too slow and they move on. If we're talking about buying products, move on usually means go to Amazon and then Amazon gets your sale instead of your company. So we want to have things as fast as possible. We want uh, product descriptions to come up quickly and we want this to work really across the globe. Consistency is not as important for a product catalog because product catalogs include things like product images, titles, descriptions. Uh, it can include price. It can include places where this is sold. So if things are a little out of date, if you have the old description that's showing up in Brazil and the new description is showing up in Germany for a minute and a half before they sync up, that's not a big deal. We do typically want to have a single source of truth for this product data. And then that way we're going to be able to essentially push out those changes to all of the replicas, to all of the other servers across the world that are actually displaying product data. In order to do this, couple technologies. One is document databases. They are great at republishing this sort of data and for maximizing performance for the type of product uh, problem we're trying to solve. As far as that single source of truth, I would probably still put it into a relational database. Technically, you could still you could just have that be in a uh, document database and globally replicate that. So this is also an option, but 
I am letting my biases show. I'm a relational database uh, uh, strongly biased in that in that direction. So what is a document database? Well, document database is a key value store. So what is a key value store? A key value store is a class of data storage solution where you have two relevant pieces of information. You have the key, which is the thing we're going to look everything up by, and you have the value, which is all of the relevant uh, attributes associated with that key. So in our case, a key might be something like a product code, and then the values will be the title, the description, the stores in which it's sold, the quantity on hand, maybe historical sales information. This value is typically a complex document stored as either JSON or some JSON-like language. So MongoDB, for example, uses BSON, binary serialization. The values may be nested. So a product may have a whole collection of images and an image may have a size, a height. So a height, a width, um, a URL for the image itself, an alt tag so that people who are unable to see the image can still read about it. And we may also have price changes, historical, store availability, as well as single attributes, current price, title, brand. Data retrieval typically is one record at a time, and that's where a document database works best. If I have a product code and I'm looking up the details of a product, bringing that product back and displaying a web page for that product, this is where a document database really shines. Document databases do allow for scans of data. If you're using a product like Cosmos DB, you're paying for that scan, but you can certainly set it up to make fairly efficient scans. Within this document DB world, uh, on premises, Firebase, CouchDB, those are a couple of competitors to MongoDB, which is uh, still the big player in document databases on premises. In the cloud, um, Amazon created DynamoDB. DynamoDB was intended to be Amazon's shopping cart. So they use this thing for shopping. Uh, every time somebody adds an item to the cart, it goes into something that is similar to DynamoDB. It's not exactly the same product that they make available to the rest of the world, but it's similar. Meanwhile, in Azure, Cosmos DB is the document storage system. Let's suppose we have a, a document database. Do we need a transactional uh, system? Do we need that relational database as well? And the answer is no, but an OLTP database can be a good choice for a really busy product catalog. And by busy, I don't mean you have millions of customers constantly trying to read from it. What I mean is you're regularly updating the data. So if updates are infrequent, then you probably can get away without having any sort of relational storage. But if you're constantly updating, then you probably want to have some golden record someplace. So all of the updates get funneled through it and distributed out to the document databases, which can be located in different parts of the world to minimize the latency uh, from a customer someplace on the planet and the nearest place where they can get to that data. This also lets you true up your document databases. I mentioned it's not really a problem if customers in Brazil see a slightly different description for a product than the ones that German customers see. If that persists, if it goes on for more than minutes, goes on for hours or days, that can be a problem. If things like price changes are not adequately updated, that can be a problem. So we want to have a system to true up a document database, potentially. As far as reference architecture goes, here is one example using uh, Azure to perform a set of lookups off of a product catalog on a website. So in this case, they're using Azure Cosmos DB 
for the product catalog. They're actually building a full text index using cognitive search and then displaying it on an Azure web app. Now let's move on not just to a from a product catalog. Let's talk about a website in general. Performance is still critical. That is going to be the most important thing. Many of these site assets are actually static. Images aren't changing between people. CSS, JavaScript, the HTML, all of these things are going to be pretty much static. The dynamic portions are when I need to display, for example, the specific product details, when I need to display what is in your shopping cart. And at this point, now we have to pull in additional information and that will be different per person. Consistency is critical for some of these things. Ordering consistency has to be important. If I have three items in my cart and I click add and my cart says it now has seven items in it, that's weird. I go to check out and it says it has two items in it. That's really weird. I enter my payment information and I now have five items in it. I'm not sure what's going on. And if I click pay and it says that I ordered one item, I'm really angry because I thought I, I thought I had four items here and you keep showing me different things. You're not actually showing me the right information. That's a scary situation to be in for a company. Also not a great, a person who sees this actually probably isn't going to order. They're just gonna go to Amazon. So very important for that type of order system. Less important for that product description. Less important for order history. Speaking of Amazon, I can order something on Amazon and after I click the order button, if I go to order history, that order may not be there yet. It may take several minutes for that order to show up. And that's okay. As a customer, I'm used to this idea that it takes some time for systems to synchronize and I'm not panicking about that. Uh, so if you have a, a small delay, that's all right. If I go immediately to that order history page, and I don't quite see it yet, that's okay. I, I'm not gonna panic about it, especially if you send me an email that confirmed that I got that order. So for making a busy website a bit faster, we've got a few relevant data storage technologies. First one is in-memory key value caching. So we're back to key value. We have some sort of storage for static content, and I'm saying simple storage, which is probably a clue. Relational database, so that OLTP system for our single source of truth. And we can also have a document database here for uh, similar to our product catalog, republishing that transactional systems information to make things faster. Let's talk very briefly, cache versus a document database. These, although they are superficially very similar, they are in fact quite different. Where they are similar is that both are key value systems, but the use cases are quite different. For a cache, the major use case is, I am going to have a key that I look up one at a time, and I need to get back a value, which is going to be very small. I want to store this in memory. I want to make this as fast as possible, and I'm going to pull back the value, the single value. So essentially, it is a resident dictionary that a lot of different processes are allowed to access. This is quite different from a document database where that value can be much larger. So for most document databases, the recommendation is the size of the document be about one megabyte or smaller. Ideally, it's going to be in the kilobyte range or several kilobytes. By contrast, for a cache, if you want a really fast cache, you're talking about single digit bytes. I want to store a number. I want to store maybe a very short string. I don't want to store a kilobyte of data, much less a megabyte of data. I mean, that's a lot to put into memory for users. 
for our document database, we are therefore okay with writing to disk. Similar to what we do with relational databases, we write to disk, we can pull to memory. If, if there's a buffer pool equivalent, then uh, have a system work that out. But you know, worst case, yeah, we pull it from disk and it will still be faster because it's distributed closer to the end user. So as we talk specifically about websites on premises, uh, in the world of caching, Redis is king. If ever you want to know how to take down a Redis server as a developer, um, my company has a great deal of experience with this and we're so, you know, it's not exactly the most stable platform. It is still really, really good at what it does. Just don't use Redis persistent cache. Uh, Memcached is another player. Hazelcast is a third player. Um, I've worked with Redis and Memcached. I've not worked with Hazelcast, but I've heard nice things about it. We still have our same document databases, our relational databases. Of course, we have the other players like Postgres and MySQL, MariahDB. Over in the cloud world, simple storage, S3. Or in Azure, we have Azure Blob Storage. This is, I'm storing things like images. Great for that. I'm storing static data, uh, JSON, you know, JSON files that are used by web pages or JavaScript files, CSS files, files that may be a little bit larger, but won't really change between users. For caching that key value lookup in AWS, they have Elastic Cache. And Elastic Cache is Amazon's version of Redis. Meanwhile, Azure has basically Redis platform as a service. So what we tend to see with Amazon is that they will take an open source product, make a lot of changes, and keep that code mostly to themselves. Azure tends to take open source products and put them in right there without doing necessarily as much in the way of changes. For that transactional database system, you know, we mentioned RDS on the Amazon side, maybe Azure SQL database on the Azure side. For that document database, DynamoDB, Cosmos DB. And by the way, for pretty much every on-premises technology, you can implement this as virtual machines in one of these clouds, but that's the easy way out. Quick note on shopping carts. I did mention that Amazon uses something like DynamoDB for their shopping carts. Unless you have an enormous scale, I would recommend a transactional processing system. I would generally recommend that for storing cart data, unless you have just a sheer enormous number of users. If you do get to that point, you can use something like DynamoDB or Cosmos DB. But make sure that you have mechanisms in place to check to ensure that you don't lose orders, to ensure that things are happening as you would expect, that all of the steps for ordering are in fact occurring and nothing gets lost in the shuffle. So that the products were available, the prices were correct, the method of billing was successful and so on. Going back to the Amazon example, you may notice when you buy something on Amazon, you don't officially buy it yet because they're gonna check your credit card. So they don't check the credit card when you push purchase now. That's a separate system that happens. And then if it fails, you'll get an email that says, oh, the card uh, validation failed. Come to our website and fix it. What would be an enormous number of users for that case? That uh, I'm going to have to demur on and give you an unsatisfactory answer um, because it's going to depend a lot on the hardware solution, the hardware that you have available. I mean, if you're talking about tens of thousands of concurrent purchasers, you can still handle that in a transactional system. You'd have to be pushing uh, bursts of enormous numbers of people. Maybe, maybe if you're talking tens of thousands of people when normally your hardware is scaled for hundreds of people. Uh, but 
Yeah, otherwise I'd have to give you a really un unfortunately vague answer because I don't have exact numbers for this. I can tell you, uh, you can handle thousands of concurrent users on a single SQL Server instance, uh, tens of thousands on a SQL Server instance, if you have the right people, if you have the right hardware. So as far as reference architectures go, here we are. This is pretty close to what I was talking about. Here they're using Azure Blob Storage for all that static content and then hosting it through a content delivery network. So something like Cloudflare, CloudFront, Azure CDN. That way it, this static data is distributed across the world and uh, no problems ever come with that. Just ask Fastly. Um, which by the way, that is a risk of distributing out these systems where if your distribution mechanism fails, you bring down the whole internet for about an hour. Here we have our caching system here for data storage, either transactional system, document database, maybe both. Let's talk about that poor data science team who's been stuck in a closet someplace because they're not allowed to access the database because they keep they brought it down that one time. So data science teams, this is from painful, painful history, need to collect more data than what is available in, in your relational databases or in your data warehouses. Typically you're going to need a lot more historical information than what other teams will want to collect or want to keep. Generally, we'll want to work with multi-structured data set. So text files where the way that you interpret the text in there can differ based on the problem you're trying to solve. Unstructured data, audio clips, video clips, they may need to parse that information. And we want that comprehensive history. And that history can get really expensive if we're storing it in a SQL Server instance, especially if you've got that pure storage array hosted with a bunch of NVMe and you're spending a lot of money getting as fast of disk access as possible. You don't want to store 20 years of data where the only people actually using it are these data scientists. So we have other technologies that are going to be a bit better for those people. And going into the world of Apache Hadoop or Spark, talking about data lakes, even graph databases. So let's jump in. Hadoop is a massive distributed batch processing system developed off of a couple of Google white papers, implemented by a uh, architect at Yahoo. This has three key components. The first is a distributed file system, the Hadoop distributed file system. The second is a way to access data in that distributed file system, and it's called MapReduce. The third is a resource allocation engine to allow different jobs to access data that's stored in that distributed system in a fairly efficient manner. So that's yarn or yet another resource negotiator. Of these, the MapReduce library has fallen out of vogue, mostly because it's really, really slow in the Hadoop implementation. But the Hadoop ecosystem as a whole is thriving, especially a product called Apache Spark. I still need to fix that. This is not the Hadoop ecosystem, obviously. I'll have an image of it later. So key players in the world of Hadoop. There are at this point two key players for on-premises Hadoop. One is Cloudera, the other is MapR. And even Cloudera is mostly moving toward use their product in their uh, platform. MapR uh, at one point was looking like they were going to go under. They have survived so far, and I'm hopeful that they do continue to survive because it's good to have that competition in here. In the cloud world, I'm going to call out three separate clouds. So the first one is Amazon with their Elastic MapReduce. Second one is Azure with HD Insight. The third one is Alibaba with its eMapReduce. All three of them, 
basically give you somewhere between infrastructure as a service and platform as a service Hadoop. So I mentioned Apache Spark. Spark gives you in-memory cluster computing distributed across a bunch of servers where operations occur in memory. This avoids the reliance on Hadoop's version of MapReduce in which they have a lot of IO. Basically, you read from disk, do a little bit of work, write to disk. Read from disk, do a little bit of work, write to disk. There's a lot of reading from disk, writing to disk in Hadoop, and that's a big part of why it's so slow. When you limit the amount of reading from disk, the amount of writing to disk, you can make things a lot faster. And these technologies have opened up this concept called the data lake, especially the distributed file system. So HDFS gives us the idea of a massive distributed storage of data, including handling that multi-structured text data, that unstructured audio video data, which typically doesn't fit well in a classic Kimball style data warehouse. So the data lake gives us a place where we can store historical information much less expensive than using a relational database and perform activities especially important for data science and machine learning where i need a lot more data for a lot more time databricks then takes this one step further with their notion of the data lake house so this is their combination of a warehouse and a data lake in one managed area to give you an idea of what it looks like this is uh, their image, a little bit of their hype. But historically, you have different sources of data that through a process get loaded into data marts, which are specialized for a particular business unit. So you may have a finance mart, an accounts payable mart, an accounts receivable mart, marketing mart, et cetera, et cetera. From there, we can use reporting tools like SQL Server Reporting Services, BI tools like Tableau or Power BI, and read data from them. Works great for known business questions. The data lake expands that out a little bit. So that data lake holds a bunch of weird structured sets of data. Some of it will be nice and happy structure like the uh, text files or uh, things like that. Others may be images, video, audio, so not as straightforward to analyze. So on the data science side, we can work directly with the data lake, pull data out from there, and perform our data processing, shaping the data in a way that we can uh, perform an analysis. At the same time, we can take data from here and use those ETL processes to generate the same data marts from our warehouse experience, or use it to populate uh, near real-time databases for Power BI-based reporting, for example. So this lake house notion, the concept behind it is, well, we don't really need these marts. We don't really need this warehouse. Because if all of your data is stored here, what if you just have the processing engine do all of the work? So we do all of that data prep and then spit out the results for reports, for uh, data science operations, for machine learning paths. This is right now, I think it's a lot of hype. Um, they've got several years before I believe that the data lake house will be really viable because the performance is not going to be good enough for a lot of companies. That lack of a data warehouse, I think, does hurt uh, performance and it will hurt enough that I don't believe anybody will want to jump into a product like Databricks and just abandon their warehouses. Four years from now, let's talk. We'll see what things, what technologies look like at that point. Maybe it differs. Maybe it's better to the point where it, it feels like you could live off of just the lake house. But for now, um, I would stick with this data lake notion. 
in the modern data warehouse world, uh, Databricks is, I think, one of the, they're the big player. So Databricks is the commercial entity behind Apache Spark. And they're available on Azure, they're available on AWS, they're available on Google Cloud. All three of those platforms will store the data in their own storage system. So for AWS, that's S3. For Azure, it's Azure Blob Storage, specifically data lake storage, which is blob storage with a couple of flags turned on. Uh, for Google, they have their own Google storage. Now, Azure and AWS also have other modern data warehouse contenders. In the AWS version, we have uh, Redshift again. In the Azure version, we have Azure Synapse Analytics. So I mentioned that analog where Azure Synapse Analytics has these dedicated SQL pools and Redshift has its distributed Postgres. Azure Synapse Analytics also has Spark pools. And those Spark pools um, are not yet competitive with Databricks. But if, if you're not very familiar with Spark, if you're just playing around with it a little bit, or you have minor Spark related tasks, they can save money over having to have both Databricks and Azure Synapse Analytics running. So let's talk graph databases. Those have a niche in the analytics space. Uh, they will combine nodes and edges. So a node represents an entity, a thing, some sort of noun. An edge is a connection between these entities. So graph databases work really well in things like path calculation, or maybe I'm trying to find the shortest distance to hit a bunch of different uh, businesses within a city. So I wanna find the roads that will take me through the city that in the least amount of time, most efficiently. Or I may do fraud detection via link analysis. So what I mean by that is, if I know that person one and person two are acting fraudulently, I may try to understand the links between person one and other people, and with person two and other people, and see, are there any other people who may be acting fraudulently uh, where those links make you a little bit more likely to be involved? This is also good for fluid relationships between entities where the relationships change a lot. So there are specific cases where I would say a graph database works really well. Uh, but I'm not the biggest fan of graph databases. The problem is you can do everything in a graph database in a relational database and you don't need as many concepts. You only need one concept, the, the relation. By contrast, you have no, nodes and edges. So two things to represent versus one thing to represent. That's my uh, analytical or academic problem with it. This, the second biggest problem that I think is closer to getting fixed is that there is no common language for relational databases, we have SQL. Now we have different dialects, of course. There's T-SQL, there's PLSQL, there are other variants of this language. But in the graph world, until fairly recently with Gremlin, there really haven't been any consistent single languages that represent uh, graph information, at least not in a computer in a computerized system. So as far as graph databases go, on-premises, there's one graph database that I would recommend, and that is Neo4j. I know that SQL Server has its own uh, graph elements in it. I don't think it's far enough along that it's really usable in a great production system. I, I think it's worth, if you're if you want to learn a bit about graph, a good place to get started. It's a nice entry point if you are a relational person, but for hardcore graph solutions, uh, definitely Neo4j. In the cloud world, Azure's Cosmos DB 
does have a Gremlin API, so you can use Cosmos documents and interconnect use in a, using a graph API. AWS has Neptune, which is uh, its own graph database. So for reference architecture, when we're talking about a warehousing solution, this is one example of building a data warehouse with Redshift, where we may have relational data in RDS and using tools, using products like Elastic uh, Beanstalk to, to pull data from RDS, load it into Elastic MapReduce, that Hadoop cluster. Uh, then on the other side, we have data that's stored in S3. We can query that data using Amazon Athena. And Athena is Hive over S3 buckets. So I mentioned Aurora earlier, which is their Postgres-like platform as a service. Athena, different product, Hive accessing data in S3. You may have pipelines using AWS Glue, which uses uh, Spark under the covers, to load data into a Redshift warehouse and feed that data out into, say, like QuickSight or Excel, where QuickSight is a visualization within Amazon's world. So kind of sort of uh, like Power BI or Tableau or Click, but not really intended to be standalone product. In the Azure world, data factory to migrate data in to data lake storage processing it perhaps using Azure Databricks. I'm not a huge fan of this reference architecture because it's basically like, yes, go pay for Databricks to do this work, but then go pay for Azure Synapse Analytics and then go pay for Azure Analysis Services. And I'm saying, I don't wanna pay that much money. I'm, I'm not made of money. Ask my wife. So uh, got a lot of options in here. And here's something that is more of a classical Hadoop uh, reference architecture. So covers a lot of the different parts of the Hadoop ecosystem. Now, IoT, real-time, and mobile applications. I'm combining them together because they all really have the same requirements. Asynchronous message passing. So devices send notifications and just wait for a response. We have a separate producer of a message versus a consumer of a message, handling probably a large number of messages. Key technologies here, message brokers, stream processing. We wanna store our data in something like HDFS or S3 or blob storage, and using usually a document database or a relational database for fast access to the data. As far as message brokers go, they pull data from producers, give data to consumers. And the really nice thing here is they provide a logical disconnect. So the consumers don't have to be actively connected to the producers. That means that, for example, if I am on a phone and I push a button and it sends a message, the consuming application doesn't have to be ready for that message right now. It just sits in a broker until it's ready. And similarly, I can get a push notification onto my phone and I don't have to respond to it immediately. I can wait until I'm ready. Stream processing will handle messages one at a time, like with Kafka streams or Flink, or in small micro batches, Spark streaming. And I'll talk briefly about the Lambda architecture because I know I'm at time, so I'm gonna have to uh, skip to the end. But let's talk Lambda real fast. Data comes in through these new data streams and it's dispatched to two separate layers. One layer is called the batch layer. The other layer is called the speed layer. The batch layer's job is permanent storage of data and it will pre-compute batch views. So you could think of this as the entire history of the company and maybe we store that data uh, in views where we've aggregated it by certain levels and show it by day. The uh, serving layer will index those batch views for performance. So I may take that data 
and I may store it in a system that could be in a SQL server or it could be in some other product, put indexes on it so that when we go to query this data, it is fairly efficient. The speed layer handles recent data. So the batch layer may run once a day and it may compute everything up to that day. The speed layer handles everything since then. And that's where we use streaming technologies, Spark Streaming or Kafka Streams or Flink. And so that serving layers combining the two, queries will merge data from the speed layer, from the uh, batch layer and serve it to an end user because the end user doesn't care what layer it came out of. They just care that they get numbers back. So in this world, uh, we have brokers. Apache Kafka is a big one, but there are literally dozens of brokers around. The speed layer, I've mentioned the three major players there. The batch layer is usually stored data in HDFS or in Blob Storage S3. And the serving layer, quite often we'll use a technology like Hive or uh, Spark to take that data, process it, or we could use Cassandra, which is a column store database um, intended for large processing of data. So Lambda will balance out speed and reliability pretty well, and it scales out actually extremely well, but uh, it is a, I would say it is a product of its time. You know, this thing came out in 2015 and it was based off of the assumptions of 2015 and of the limitations of products in 2015. So you have code replicated in multiple services. Rows that come through the streaming layer and rows that come through the batch layer may not exactly be the same. So the numbers may change over time as you process the final numbers. And there are a lot of working parts, which can make it complicated, can mean that more things break. But if you want a uh, modern technology setup that works really well and handles both problems, storing huge amounts of data and getting results back very quickly, this is still, I think, the most reasonable compromise. And here's an example of where Azure IoT, so IoT data is coming in and is handled through a warm path and a cold path, and it's still following sort of that Lambda architecture. So let's hop to the end uh, on account of being all out of time. So we've taken a look at the data platform space as it stands. I think this is a fast changing field with some interesting competitors. And if you'd like to learn more, you know, if you want to grab those slides, if you want to grab links to additional resources, it's all at csmore.info slash on slash CDP. If you have any questions at all, please do feel free to reach out to me. Here is my email address and here is my Twitter handle. I am happy to take any questions. So Mark K has a question about data fabric. And what I'm looking for is pulling up a great uh, post by James Sarah on data fabrics. And here's a link to James's um, blog post on the topic where I think he's going to do a better job of explaining the notion than I will, especially because I am out of time. So I wanted to give you an answer to the question, understanding that I was out of time. Uh, hopefully that is helpful. And with that, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Kevin, and uh, great presentation. And uh, it's okay that you're out of time. We wish we could hear more, but uh, yeah, this has been awesome. Look at all the applause. This is great. Thank you.